Isn't it nice to know that no matter where we are, our Heavenly Father has his attention on his children. No matter what situation we find ourselves in, where we've come from, our background, our, our interest, uh, those things that are coming up, he, he focuses his attention on his children because of that tremendous love. And so you come to him in prayer today um, as a body, as a corporate body, and thankful that his presence is here. It is not only felt and known, but it is understood. And so let's look to him in prayer, please. Our gracious Father, we pause in our morning worship to acknowledge your hand upon us, your goodness from before the foundation of the world, your choosing uh, your own and bringing us to a place in life where we not only recognize that you are our Heavenly Father, but we delight in it. Thank you for the blessings of this past week, for walking with us, for the simple things, clothing upon our back, uh, transportation, the food upon our tables, a measure of health. Thank you, Father, for our family, loved ones, and friends. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for the privilege that we have to come here and join our hearts together to not only sing your praise, but to allow, Father, your spirit to work through us in order that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of this country that we live in, for the freedoms that we have, the freedom to worship. And we ask, Father, that you'll continue to keep us in such a heart stead. We recognize the challenging times that we face. We, throughout the week, are burdened by the news of, of uh, indiscriminate shootings, and robbings, and the, the abundance of, of things that no doubt uh, have um, brought grief to your heart to see the direction that the lives of men and women and boys and girls have gone. And yet, Father, you can do all things. We know by the power of the preaching of your word, by the testimony of your children, our men and women, boys and girls, brought again to a place of a saving knowledge of the Savior. Thank you, Father, for such a work that was done one time in our hearts and will continue to do so until Jesus returns. Thank you for the comfort and peace that you've provided not only for us this past week, but for your children all around. Thank you for Pastor Dave and his wife and pray that this uh, coming week will be a time of relaxation that he would recall to pray for us too at our worship hour and would remember those particular needs for that ministry of prayer continues no matter where we are no matter what we're engaged in thank you for the work of your holy spirit convicting us and granting us father an understanding of your word that precious word from genesis to revelation a lamp unto our feet a light unto our path Thank you for its truth. Thank you for its preciousness. Thank you for all that is done, it is doing now, and shall continue to do. May, Father, we be students of the word. May we harvest it. May we apply it, practically speaking, in everyday life. Thank you, Father, for the people that you bring to our path. Thank you for the opportunities we have to share Christ with them. We're burdened for those who are still without, maybe a neighbor, maybe somebody we met in the store, maybe a family member. And Lord, we earnestly desire for them to know Christ. And we ask, Lord, give us an open window, an open door, an opportunity just to, to testify of your goodness to them, your love for them, and how they might know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, we trust in your spirit to do that particular work. Thank you again for joining us here together uh, to begin a new week with you. Uh, thank you for each family, each individual represented here. And we thank you again, Father, for a recognition that our country has on being Father's Day. The responsibilities are tremendous. We recognize, Lord, that uh, throughout our land there are fatherless families, and we grieve for them, uh, sometimes because of, uh, of death, but many times, Father, we've seen it has been because of a departure of the responsibility of that man to his wife and children and it's burdensome, Father. And yet, Father, we know that's not pleasing to you. And Father, the privilege of knowing that we as a body of Christ will do what we can to show the love of Jesus to those families who are without fathers and to those fathers who are neglecting their responsibilities. Again, Father, thank you for joining us together as we continue in our worship. In Jesus' name, amen.
Psalm number 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now, you may be seated. Pastor's message, Father's, Father's Day. Well, thank you all for your invitation and the warm welcome. We do appreciate it. Uh, we're praising the Lord for his goodness and kindness to us each and every day. Just to take notice, you should have had a little insert there, a trifold uh, about admission. Independent Board is uh, celebrating, or it has celebrated, uh, its uh, initial organizational meeting as of June of 1933. You recall that? Mrs. Decker, you recall back 1933? <laughs> yeah. um, our uh, website, uh, com. Uh, we're in the uh, process of having it updated, uh, and there are some updates on there now, some new pictures we're going to try and get in. When you have time, take a look at it and see what's going on. This past year has been a difficult one, as you can well imagine. Uh, the coronavirus continues to wreak havoc across a lot of third world nations. Um, a lot of the schools, uh, churches are still closed, uh, meeting virtually. Um, the Bible College in Nairobi and one in Rwanda uh, and one in Tanzania uh, were able to open at the beginning of the year, uh, but with a lot of restrictions. Uh, and travel within the country has, has been difficult. Uh, Jim and Melody Buer, I don't know if you're familiar with the Buers, uh, they have a very active ministry down in the very northern part of Chile, Arica. And uh, every Sunday, they'll have a message on Facebook. Thank you. If anybody likes a drink, you just have to wait. Um, they have a very active ministry. If you're on Facebook, you can look up the Buers, uh, B-J-U-R, and catch Jim's sermon in Spanish, unless you don't know Spanish. And, uh, and then Millie, uh, she has a, what would you call it, a puppet, I guess, you know, and it has a, just a fantastic lesson for the children. Uh, and that, she says, I've received a lot of uh, inquiries all the way up into Mexico, all throughout South America. Uh, most recently, actually through the past year, they've had an influx of Venezuelans. Uh, the, uh, the crushing economy and the political situation in Venezuela has forced a lot of them to exit their country. And uh, Erika is on the border, the northern border of Chile and Peru, and uh, Melody says we've had a lot of Venezuelans come in, uh, but they can't get jobs because the economy is basically closed down, so she says this has been our opportunity to bring Christ to them, and they've had some tremendous testimonies of Venezuelans coming to know, to know the Lord, and many of them who were Christians in Venezuela are now part of the church, so it's a, a, a very different year. Uh, 2021 is continuing on and basically in the same vein as 2020 for a lot of those countries. Uh, so we appreciate your prayers on their behalf. But just pause for a quick word of prayer before we look at his word. Father, thank you for the privilege of allowing us to speak uh, on your behalf, your servant to be hidden and Christ to be glorified in all. We thank you for the truth of it. May it be seeds sown into the hearts to find fertile soil to produce a hundredfold of fruit. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, according to the infallible Wikipedia, if you're on the computer, you'll know what that is. Father's Day is a celebration honoring fathers and celebrating fatherhood, paternal bonds, and the influence of fathers in society. Actually, you can go all the way back to the Middle Ages uh, and find that Father, uh, Father's Day was celebrated, at least amongst the Roman Catholic countries, on March 19th. And to be honest with you, you look around the world and Father's Day is, is remembered or celebrated in some fashion in March, April, or June, one of those uh, three months. 
When you think about it, though, I think Father's Day kind of complements other celebrations, such as Mother's Day or Siblings Day or Grandparents Day. I remember my boys saying, when's it going to be Kids Day? And that was a hard one to, you know, I said, well, every day is Kids Day. You know, that didn't really go over very well. Yet as Christians, when we think about it biblically, there's obviously no such holiday. Men, we don't even have a Proverbs 31 man in the scriptures, do we? You know, maybe we would uh, look for one like that, but there isn't any. Uh, there's no really godly example uh, throughout the scriptures. There are passages that are easy for pastors to look after, uh, Old Testament examples of men and women, or men, uh, uh, New Testament examples of men, uh, some commands that are given to fathers, how you ought to act and what the things that you ought to be doing. Uh, yet if you listen to a lot of the critics around, it'd be easy to point out the inconsistencies of fathers within the Bible. And they'll go back and they'll say, well, what about the, the, the Old Testament patriarch Abraham? Uh, didn't he abandon his first son, Ishmael? Say, what kind of a father is that? They'll look to other ones and they say, well, what about Jacob? He had two wives and two concubines. Well, that clearly muddied the waters about being a faithful husband to one wife, you know. Hard for the critic to handle that. You continue on and you find King David with 20 sons, sons that were involved in murder, sons that were involved in incest and rebellion. Or Solomon, a thousand wives and concubines. Boy, that was a difficult situation to speak about as far as examples of being a father as we would want to think about it. So when someone looks to find a great example in the Bible, the stellar illustrations like a Proverbs 31 woman, as far as a man's concerned, there really isn't any, is there? And it may be depressing, and yet if we look in the, the word of God, we find that we do have a great example of a father, and it's our Heavenly Father. So I ask you to look in your Bibles to uh, the book of Philippians. The Apostle Paul provides for us a powerful example in his letter to the church at Philippi. And he speaks to them, not in terms of understanding of fathers and children, but he speaks to them in terms of relationships. And we're going to pick out five of these verses and just to see examples that are offered us by Paul. Book of Philippians. The first one comes out of chapter 1 and verse 6. The apostle says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Our Heavenly Father is always faithful to his children. Our Heavenly Father is always faithful to his children. You know, us earthly fathers are very often faced with the struggle of not being what we should or what we could. To our children. It might begin as a broken promise. It may continue over the years as seen in dad. It's a weakness because of the way you weren't doing what you should be doing. It could be eventually looked upon as a loss of respect or a loss of love from a child, a son, or a daughter. You know, I think about those parts within the scriptures that aren't actually there. I think Jacob told every one of his 13 children, I love you. And yet Jacob had a favorite, didn't he? He looked upon Joseph and he says, I love all of my children, but the favoritism was seen by the way he displayed it within that family and that relationship between the siblings was evident, the hatred and the outcome. That was something that Jacob never even planned as a father. We all have had experiences with our own fathers that weren't necessarily needed when they possibly didn't do or provide or protect as they should have or could have. Look back and I think of the days with my dad or I look on my own life and the days with my own boys. At the time we look back and we remember those days and we say, yes, there were reasons. Dad had reasons, dad had excuses, why he did, why he acted, why I didn't receive or I didn't get or whatever. But nevertheless, legitimate or not, I know that there have been times when those source of discouragements of the unfaithfulness of fathers have been a disappointment 
to their children. Now look again what Paul says, being confident of this very thing. Paul says, I am fully persuaded without a shadow of a doubt in my heart and mind, by my own experience and by my own life, being confident in this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you, which is whom? Who is that? It's God. Who could perform a good work in us, but none other than God? Paul says, I have the absolute assurance in life, my own testimony, that the one who began the good work in you, by his grace, will perform it, or will continue to do it, will, will con be consistent in this until the day of Jesus Christ. There are times of giving up on us, going along and say, well, let's do it this week and not next week. Paul says, throughout my life, my life's experience, God has been faithful to me. From the moment that relationship began with our Heavenly Father, before the foundation of the world, through the days that we struggled in darkness, till the day that our adoption papers were signed, even up to the very moment that we're sitting here today, he indeed continues to work in us a work of grace. His faithfulness will bring it to completion. Find a verse in the Bible where our Heavenly Father has promised you something, and one day you can go to him and say, you didn't do this. Find a, find a passage in here where God promises something and says, you failed me here. But there isn't any, is there? None has failed. Neither ever shall fail, making us indeed like unto our only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, his intent. Thomas Chisholm, have you ever heard of Thomas Chisholm? Okay. A few um, known uh, as the, the psalm writer of Ventnor, New Jersey. Uh, he was born in 1866, ordained as a Methodist minister in 1903, but <clears throat> only completed one term, one cycle in the church because of poor health. Uh, married, had two daughters, uh, moved on to Illinois, or Indiana, and then to Vineland, New Jersey, in 1916, he sold insurance, retired at uh, the age at in 1953, and remained in a Methodist uh, home for a retirement home there in New Jersey. But what he became known for, uh, there are many hymns in the hymnals you find, but uh, there's really one that was his uh, most famous. Let me read to you what he had written at the age of 75. My income has never been much, in fact, poor health has followed me since my earliest years. But I must not fail to record that the unfailing faithfulness of our covenant-keeping God has been given me many wonderful displays of providential care for which I am eternally thankful. You know what his famous hymn was? Great is thy faithfulness. He writes it out of a sincere relationship of he says, I can't provide for my family as I should. I can't meet this need. My health is poor and all of these other things. And yet, and he ended up living to be 94, uh, had written 1,200 poems, many of which are found translated into the hymnals. He says, but God has always been faithful to me. Being confident in this very thing, that the one who began the good work in us, Paul, Thomas Chisholm, each of us, will continue to perform it, not abandon the task along the way, but be faithful at that which he started in us and to continue on with that wonderful testimony that he has. So our Heavenly Father is always faithful to his children. Now look over to chapter 4 and verse 6. Chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul writes, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. I'd like to apply this to say that God, our God, is always accessible. He's always accessible. Sorry, Dad's out. Out of town. He's sleeping right now. He's very busy. He's not feeling good. Dad's not at home. Dad's in Canada. 
mowing the lawn. He's out fishing. He's at the ballpark. He's with Fred and Bill in his office. I don't know where dad is. <laughs> the accessibility of children to their father isn't always there, is it? You know, not always on time. Even now, at my advanced age, I love to talk with my dad, but I can't because he's in glory. But I keep the cell phone's accessibility with my boys and try as often as we can to keep in touch. Always try to be accessible to them, although not often as I would like. Philippians 4, 6, the apostle says, be careful for nothing. Careful, a stronger picture of this is a picture of anxiety or worry. He says, don't let anxiety or worry overwhelm you. Uh, irrespective of what that particular state is. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Worry and anxiety don't have boundaries, do they? They can come up at any time of the night or day. Any situation. Anything can trigger it. The doctor's appointment next week, looking at the bank statement, the phone call, the, the neighbor who yells across the road, all of a sudden the blood pressure goes up a little bit or a cloud of fear and worry hangs over. It doesn't matter. It can, can be any time of the night or day. I can't get to sleep. I just don't know what I'm going to do. So here Paul says, the accessibility of your heavenly father is there. Anywhere, anytime. All you need to do is come to him he says, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Why thanksgiving? <laughs> You're there, Dad. You're there, my Heavenly Father. Let those requests be made known unto God. The words of our Lord himself in Matthew 6. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought of your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, nor yet your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Those are kind of three key areas that we worry about, isn't it? You know, uh, life in general. Uh, what is my life? Eating, drinking, uh, what am I going to put on the body? Uh, this past year, 2020, was one of those conflicts, you know. Where are we going to find toilet paper, you know? It's, that's kind of in a different version, you know. But the, the, the panic that overruns us. What's going to happen if we run out of this? And what happened if we can't do this? One thing or another and flows on. And yet Paul says, our Heavenly Father, there's an assurance of his availability at any time. And it's just not that he's there. Dad, don't bother me now. I'm working on the big things, the big countries, you know, working on communism and, uh, and, and uh, Islam and such. No. His interest is in each of his children. So he says, there's access that's there. The psalmist writes in 139, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Either darkness shall not hide from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Where will I go? Is there a place that I could hide? In, in, in one sense, you know, you can't hide from God. But in another sense, there's not a place that I am or that I will be going or that I have been, that he has not been there with his children. What a glorious picture that our Heavenly Father is always accessible, no matter where I go, no matter what takes place. So if that's the case, if he's always accessible, <clears throat> what does that give us? What does verse 7 say? 4, 7. <clears throat> and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. My Heavenly Father is the only source of real, true peace. If he's faithful, if he's always accessible, then peace is at my door at all times, giving it 
as it truly is. Problem is, because we are children of Adam, born into that family, the relationship with our earthly fathers has not always been that's one that produced peace. You know, There's always been some tensions between children and the father. It's a conflict of interest. It's a matter of disobedience. It's a matter of, of an assorted other issues that have resulted in some very strong differences between children and fathers. Remember the days that my dad and I butted heads. I was convinced that what I was thinking or what that I had planned was right. And Pop was one not to let that happen. And we just butted heads terribly. And again, the reason of the lack of peace was my own sinful nature. The lack of peace was his own sinful nature. Both as believers, but because we are children of Adam, that conflict existed. <laughs> I was thinking of examples in the scriptures. Esau and Jacob, remember how there was some trickery going on with the father? Jacob tricked Isaac, and the tension became so thick after a while that you could cut it with a knife. Children of Adam. He loved his children, but what had taken place was this the chicanery, well, he doesn't see real well, so I'm going to trick him in this. And, of course, mom wasn't in much of a help there and encouraged it on. So conflict, and it, that conflict existed between Jacob and Esau for many years. Then there was Jacob's favoring of Joseph. We talked about that lack of peace that occurred within that family. The brothers hating Joseph so much, and it resulted because of no peace. We ought to mention David. Think of Absalom, the son who wanted to kill his father. The tension that existed, no peace that was found there. So it was strong. And then Eli, two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. <laughs> total disasters. Total disasters. No peace within the, the household of the high priest, even in those days. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. This verse says that our Heavenly Father, by grace, freely provides peace. And he delights in doing it. Does he delight in seeing us in turmoil and confusion and worry? No. He delights in giving us peace within our hearts that we not only are having peace, but that we acknowledge that he is the source of peace. He's the source of all of these blessings, so he benefits from them all. One man wrote and said that this peace is the smile of God reflected on the soul of the believer. He delights in such. The only lack of peace occurs when any child of God decides to step out on his own. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it my way. And we do that with our parents. I recall whether it was vocal or, or, or my actions when I did it with my dad. I'm going to do it my way. Go my place. Do whatever. But we also do it with our Heavenly Father. I'm going to go my own way. I know what your word says. I know what the preacher says. I know what my own heart is kind of saying, but... But this day or this year or whatever, I'm going to do it my way to satisfy myself. Remember the prodigal son? Everything was well. Enjoyed life. Had the benefits and the blessings of the household of a father who loved him. Some jealousies seemed to have existed within his older brother. And yet there was no peace until he left doing it my way. Left the tutelage, left the, the, the provisions of his father and finally fell upon uh, the worst of situations. And only as he, he found himself on the bottom of the, uh, of the very bottom uh, could he acknowledge the fact that, boy, my, the servants of my father's house have it better than I do. I'm going to go back and, and say, Dad, you know, I was wrong. Peace was established once that was achieved. Once again, peace within his heart the direction that it occurred. The prophet Isaiah writes, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. He says, perfect peace is found when my heart, my mind, 
is its attention is on the Lord, the good shepherd, the, the provider for everything, the one who walks with me and talks with me and guides me and, and does all of this as my heart is sealed on him. I will have such peace. In a day in which is racked with confusion and uncertainty, trials and tribulation, isn't it wonderful that our Father in heaven grants us such peace as we just look to him? Fourth one is in verse chapter 4 and verse 19. A little bit past what we're at. Chapter 4 and verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Our Heavenly Father meets all our needs. Our Heavenly Father meets all our needs. You know, this is a, always a bone of contention with earthly fathers and children. You promised me a pony for my birthday. Mm, you know, I need a new cell phone. You think I'm going to go to school in these clothes? I wore them last year. And whatever it is, you know, isn't it about time you got me a car? You know, isn't it about time for this or whatever? And we understand it's a principle of want and needs. And we're bothered at times when we hear children acting that way to adults. Yet we know the difference between wants and needs. Jacob wanting the blessing of his father Isaac and was willing to cheat and lie to achieve that. Absalom, wanting to be king and willing to do whatever is necessary to get that position of king over the nation. Ananias and Sapphira wanted recognition and profit, and they were willing to lie about the sale of the property. Death met them at the door. In our day, we've all seen what's happened between one and another. We can label it greed. We can label it uh, entitlement. I deserve this. It's your responsibility to give it to me. Indeed, I need this and I'll do whatever it takes to get it. When we hear somebody say that, we say, how could you, how could you act like that? And yet how often have we come to our Lord and say, Lord, I need this. Really, it's I want this. It's not a matter of need. How do we think when we would come to him and say, Lord, you owe me. I deserve this. Paul's words are quite true, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Note here he says, but my God. How personal is that? My heavenly father shall supply all my needs. There are others who could have, and Paul could have looked to others, you church in Thessalonica, or you, uh, you believers here in, in, in uh, uh, Achaia, uh, wherever these things are, you can supply. But Paul's words were always, but my God, very personal, loving understanding of his heavenly father's relationship. Again, Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord shepherds me. And there's not a thing that I would find lacking in life. If I'm truly honest with myself, what he knows that I need, he says, he is my shepherd, and I will never be in a place of wanting. He knows my needs, and he meets them. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus in proportion to the infinite supply that he has. You think sometimes, how come I haven't gotten how come I haven't made this achievement? How come this has been lacking on me? And look at them. The Psalms are full of those pictures drawn. Look at the world. Look what the sinner does. Look how he's achieved in advance. And look at me. And yet that's not how the scripture points it out. Out of the riches of his glory by Christ Jesus. Oh my, his vast supply. Our heavenly father, indeed. Our last point is in verse 20, chapter 4 and verse 20. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Heavenly Father is the only one to receive glory. He's the only one to receive glory. You know, I'm thinking at this letter that he's written here. 
If my Father in heaven has always been faithful, always been accessible, he's always been the source of true peace in my life, he's always been the supplier of my need, what do I give him? He's never failed in any of these areas. What do I give him? He doesn't need a necktie. He doesn't need a card with a fishing pole on it or a Bible verse on it with a coffee mug or something like that. You know, if you really think about it, what he would really delight in having is our undivided attention, our obedience, and our love. You know, I think earthly fathers crave for that also. The attention of the children. The, the love that would be due to them and their obedience. But we lack simply because we are children of Adam. Dr. Thomas Lambie, and the picture on the, the front of here, the man smiling on the top, that's Dr. Lambie. He served as a missionary. Oops, that could have been disastrous. He served as a missionary in uh, the Sudan region. Uh, for many years, a medical doctor, uh, finally came under the independent board in uh, uh, the late 40s and started a tuberculosis hospital in the Holy Land, Jordan at the time, uh, and then uh, moved across uh, a little bit farther and opened another hospital. Um, he served in Ethiopia, Sudan, Nigeria, last in Palestine. I'd like to read to you a paragraph that came uh, from his book, A Doctor's Great Commission. This is the very end of the book, and he says, And so, dear reader, we have come to the end at last, but I would like my last words to be that of praise to God and our Lord Jesus Christ. For anything of value that has been done in my poor life, may all the glory be his. All the mistakes and failures are mine. I lay down my pen leaving the future of this great work to God and to you, that everything that hath breath, praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. Now here's a man who could have and has achieved monumental uh, places of, of history. He still holds the record in horseback as a medical doctor across, at the time, what was called Abyssinia, uh, across Ethiopia and the Sudan and that. He, riding horses, established five hospitals. Uh, he was the personal physician to the Emperor Haile Selassie. Um, he had lost his U.S. citizenship, gave it up so he could work for the Red Cross in Ethiopia, had Congress uh, bring him back as a U.S. citizen, um, and he was the, uh, I wanted to say the chairman, but the, the organization that oversees the tomb uh, where the Lord is supposed to be buried in the Holy Land, and that was his task there. On the day before Easter, 1954, he was sitting in the garden tomb, praying with his wife and another man, and he was going to preach that next uh, Lord's Day, uh, Sunday, Easter Sunday, and the Lord took him home. He went to sleep right then. If there was ever a person who could have achieved uh, the praise of men, deservedly so it was him. But he says, the evaluation of all of my life, of everything that's been said, he says, if there's anything of praise, it's because of him. If there's any mistakes or failures, he says, I take those responsibilities. You know, as we think of earthly fathers, the challenge is great for those uh, uh, who have struggled in that relationship, whether as a father or as a child. Uh, you know, God, give grace to assist us in those works. Um, and yet we say, Lord, you have always been a father in heaven who has always been a blessing to us. Never forget that. Always give him praise. Always look to him as the source of those things that he alone can give us. And when it's done at the end of the day, uh, just like Dr. Lambie says, everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, we'll pause now in our our service, and are thankful that you are our Heavenly Father. Lord, if there's somebody here today who um, is ignorant of that relationship, who um, perhaps is distant from even understanding it or accepting it or recognizing it, uh, 
may you not give them rest until they come to that understanding. For you indeed have created all things and sustained all things. Uh, you measure the heavens in the span. You have provided for us everything. And we know one day that we will have to stand before you. For those who do not know you as a father in heaven, the account upon which they will have to give will be meaningless and empty. But to those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior, your perfect gift, we can come unto you and say, Father, you deserve all the praise and glory for all that has been my life. And we cast our crowns at your feet. But you indeed are worthy. Jesus, Father, we ask you now to bless these seed thoughts to our hearts. May we continue not only to enjoy this day as it is a Father's Day, as it is the Lord's Day, but we, we enjoy it as children of the living God. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.